It's a picture that ran uh, in last month's New Yorker with a profile of Eugene Debs, raising the question of why still the interest of Eugene Debs so long after. And I think to answer it, we need to look at three aspects of his life. Eugene Debs decided to leave school at age 14 and go work, work in the railroads, obviously because he was a family of very limited means. Uh, this would shape his life for the next several decades as he went back and forth between being a union leader, uh, becoming the head of the uh, Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen, and also a political career, being elected as town clerk twice uh, in Terre Haute, Indiana, and to the legislature for a single term in Indiana. Um, but in 1893, his status in the labor movement was such that when the American Railway Union was formed, he was the first leader of it. The ARU was an industrial union, which was a major change uh, in the railway industry, as opposed to the brotherhoods, which only represented engineers, firemen, etc. This represented anybody who worked in a, a railroad. The, the possibilities of solidarity were obviously significantly greater. Um, a very eventful uh, year followed. The next year came the Pullman strike. Pullman was a company that made sleeping cars that also operated a company town just outside of Chicago. It meant that Pullman's workers not only worked in the company's factories, but they lived in the housing that the company rented, and they shopped in the stores that the company provided, even worshipped in the church that they rented from the, the company. That year, the company announced there would be a decrease in the workers' wages, but there would be no comparable decrease in the rent, the prices, etc. The Pullman workers went on strike, and the question immediately was, would the ARU support them? Um, and they did. The ARU was already the largest union in the country, and over 100,000 uh, railway workers, some say over 200,000, refused to handle any trains with Pullman cars. Uh, President Grover Cleveland called out federal troops. 30 strikers were killed. There was substantial property damage. The strike ultimately failed. Its leaders, including Eugene Debs, were arrested. Debs was so notorious among the opposition to the strike that it was called the Debs Rebellion. Debs was sentenced to a term in the Woodstock jail, where he had many visitors, one of whom was a man named Victor Berger, who was one of the most prominent socialist leaders in the country at that time, who would later go on to represent Milwaukee for several terms in the US Congress. He brought along a gift, a copy of Karl Marx's Capital. Debs obviously had time on his hands. He read Capital, came to the conclusion that he was a socialist. Uh, there is, <laughs> you approve. Uh, there really was no precedent for a person with his type of reputation announcing that they had decided there was a social, he was a socialist. And there really may not be anybody since that time of that standing. He also published a number of letters uh, from the Woodstock jail. I want to read from one of them because it explains something about why we still pay attention to Eugene Debs. It is time that organized labor should learn the power and the imperative necessity of a unified ballot and in this is meant the ballot of all who work for their daily bread without regard to color or sex. A lot of 19th century socialists would not have said something like that. Uh, that is part of the reason why we pay attention, I think, in the 21st century. The second aspect, really the third, that I want to come to second, is Debs the anti-war leader. And again, the magnitude is quite substantial. The war we're talking about is the First World War. Um, and it would be fair to say, in some respect, that the rest of the history of the socialist movement worldwide in the 20th century was something of a footnote to the First World War. Socialists had agreed in international conventions that their parties would never support the war of their working class attacking another country's working class. But when it happened, most of them failed the test, most notably the German party, which was the largest socialist party in the world and the largest of all parties in Germany. When a vote came up for war credits, they almost unanimously voted for it. On the other hand, the Socialist Party of America, which admittedly had far less to lose, steadfast. Many socialists left and supported the war, but the party stuck with it, as did its most prominent leader. Eugene Debs. 
And from uh, the tenor of his statement, you can see something about the level of his opposition. He wrote or spoke, let the capitalists do their own fighting and furnish their own corpses, and there will never be another war on the face of the earth. Not a mild opposition. The, the most prominent part of Debs' career was, of course, his five campaigns for the presidency as the candidacy of the Socialist Party. Uh, the one that came after the war in 1920, he did no speaking for it because he was a prisoner in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. In the other races, of course, he did a great deal of it. And uh, if no, uh, it appears that no record exists of his voice, but if you read his speeches, you'll hear somebody who knew how to talk, plain talk about American socialism uh, that didn't sound like a torturous translation of a foreign ideology which had not always been the case with a lot of people uh, talking socialism uh, at that point. Um, he toured the country in a train called the Red Special. Um, his lot, largest vote came in 1920, over a million votes, but that was after uh, women's suffrage had finally happened. So his highest percentage of the vote was in 1912. 1912 was a very interesting election for a number of reasons. Number one, Republican finished third because Teddy Roosevelt ran against the sitting Republican president, William Howard Taft. The other interesting thing was it was the first time that four candidates got 5% or more of the vote. People understandably thought that maybe this was a sea change. Maybe there would be a change at the top. Maybe the socialists would move on from this high point to some, something greater. As we know, neither of these things happened. A Republican has never finished out of the top two since that time and that was the peak socialist vote. Now, we, um, we talk about Debs a lot in glowing terms because we think of him, uh, we think of the period as the good old days, sort of the high point of, of the socialist party. But what, I want to leave you with an upbeat thought. Debs' vote in 1912, which was the highest percentage, was a bit over 900,000. If we were to prorate that to the 2016 popula population, it would be something over 3 million votes. If we were to compare that to Bernie Sanders' vote in 2016, it would be dwarfed. He got over 13 million votes. Now, my point with this is that in terms of, on the electoral arena at least, in terms of socialism in America, these are the good old days. <laughs> Obviously, we have a long way to go, a very long way to go, but we should not be in awe of what happened 100 years ago. Uh, we should hold them in the highest regard. I think there, there has never been anybody who spoke quite the way Debs did, um, but we here today are in some ways ahead of where they all were at that time. Thank you.